Okay, well, now we're going to history class, Brian, because uh, a lot of people have been liking. Past couple weeks, we've had some segments from Scott Teal's uh, crowbarpress.com St. Louis program reprints. Uh, and I think it was last week we uh, discovered by reading what Scott has put out here. So it's not like we were discovering anything, but it was an overlooked fact. The very first televised world title change in wrestling was in St. Louis in 1947, an experimental broadcast. Um, in this one, this is one of the programs from December 1951. And like we, we've, we've explained where these came from, but if you go to crowbarpress.com, their classic arena program six, seven, and eight, which covers St. Louis through 1943 through 1951. But there was, we mentioned that they were the, the programs in St. Louis because Sam Muchnick was an ex sports writer and St. Louis was always presented as a sport. So the programs were very well written and more newspaper like sports news, things like that. And there is in this program of a, um, excerpt from a wall street journal article on wrestling in 1951 and there's some parallels to the 50s the 80s and to a lesser extent the modern day is that every once in a while the media finds wrestling and declares that it's hot and you've been through this brian and even though in various places wrestling had been hot it just wasn't the place that the media thought. And when wrestling got on network television, when television became a thing in the late 40s, suddenly it did bring a boom in some places, but it brought a bust television in a few other places. But since there had been no wrestling, as we've mentioned so many times, in New York City and Madison Square Garden, it was in the smaller clubs and the, the outer boroughs, etc., but there was no wrestling in Madison Square Garden. So now when wrestling's on national television and wrestling has come back in Madison Square Garden in New York, the national media thought that it, it had all been bad and that was all good again. Same thing with the 80s, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing with the Attitude Era. But this was the Wall Street Journal in 1951. Have you read this one yet, Brian? I don't know if I have. Um... The Golden Superman, the Great Scott, and the Red Menace are helping to write one of the outstanding business success stories of 1951. The, this is from the Wall Street Journal. As a matter of fact, page one of the Wall Street Journal, apparently, of that era. The above-mentioned businessmen are professional wrestlers. About five years ago, their industry was flourishing about as mightily as the buggy business. Today, it's headed for its biggest year ever. And at a time when most of the amusement industry from baseball to opera is floundering in red ink thus far this year, about 12 million persons in the United States have paid about $15 million. And this is back when three and $2 ringside dollar 75 cent general admission, etc., to see the professional grunt and groaners. That's a 9% rise in attendance and 11% gain in gate receipts over a year ago. And this is where it gets funky, because I don't know where they got these records. Compared with 1946, the rise in attendance amounts to 164%. The gate receipt gain comes to about 180%. <clears throat> but about 300 arenas in about the same number of cities from coast to coast are staging wrestling matches this year, about twice as many as in 1946. Uh, this year, promoters in about 30 cities will gross 300000 or more. Six years ago, they weren't in, there weren't any taking in that much. That, I believe, because the changes in ticket prices and the year after World War II, but also this brings up something really interesting. Television and the start of the formation of the territories and the starting of the territories running spot shows that the main promoters wouldn't have run smaller markets, smaller towns happened in the fifties. So there were, and also as the interstate highway system got started in what, 1956, 57, but the difference in amounts of 
professional wrestling events run from the, say, late 40s to the early 60s is tremendous because of all those things. It was easier to get places. Television exposure, once it set in, made stars out of the guys. Uh, territories formed, and instead of a a promoter like Sam Muchnick in St. Louis, there were a ton of promoters that just promoted their own town, uh, a major city in the 30s and 40s. But as the territories formed, they needed more towns and more shows around their particular bases. But anyway, wrestling was in the Wall Street Journal in 1951, and they were saying that five years previously, <clears throat> wrestling was about as popular as the buggy whip business. But Sam Muchnick has a column in the previous month's program. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not even the previous month's. It's his previous event. Uh, because both Sports Pointers, the PAX and later Thez promotion, and in the ring, Sam Muchnick's program covered the Wall Street Journal article. But Muchnick brings up the incredible run that we talked about a week or two here ago on the program, Bill Longson, between 1942 and 1945, over a three-year period in 58 shows, had sold 573,000 tickets. And that was during the period of time. And then later on, um, over the previous several years, the keel under Thez and Watson had uh, done up to, well, a number of sellouts, and the arena did 17,796 on March 15th, 1951. That was, oh God, that big uh, Thez Longson match rematch, I think. Anyway, point being, um, it's the appearance, and it's, uh, as Vince McMahon always said, perception is reality. The wrestling business until the modern day, was always hot somewhere. And it might not have been in the, in the modern media centers. <clears throat> so to the people in New York and hence to the national media, in the 40s, wrestling was deader than a doornail. But in St. Louis and Toronto and Houston and these other places, it was drawing record crowds. But that didn't fit the narrative. So everyone, whenever somebody, whether it's the network TV the first time around in the early 50s in New York, or then whether it's Vince's national expansion, which was based out of New York, or then whether it was the Attitude Era in the 90s, which contained a promotion that was based in New York, all of a sudden the national media is going, well, wrestling's hot again. It's been cold. It, w it was cold, actually, in the early 90s, but that wasn't the territory's fault because the people that made it cold, the two big companies, had run them out of business. But it was never cold in the, in the 40s everywhere, and it wasn't cold. Uh, it was the furthest thing from cold in the 80s for Vince's national expansion. The 70s was probably the most successful decade that almost all of the modern territories ever had at the gate. But uh, I thought that was interesting. Twelve. It, here's the thing. 12 million tickets sold in 1951. How many did we sell in 2021, you think, for wrestling? For any, all, any and all pro wrestling events, even the ones that label themselves as pro wrestling and ought to be hauled in for false advertising, how many tickets you think got sold in the United States in, well, I can't say. You can't say 2021. Fucking COVID. Yeah. 2019 or 2020, which we, we got disrupted in 2020. How many you think were sold in 2019? I have no idea. There is said, well, the, the WWE is. How many shows do they even run anymore? Yeah. Well, they're, they're publicly traded, so they report or at least used to, but I think somebody figured it out a few years ago that they were around six or 700,000 tickets per year. Now, everybody out there, bear with me. Is that counting this? WrestleMania? Well, that's was what, it or that, was it? Well, that's 100,000 tickets, right? Well, I mean, give or that, take. that was before they, they started doing WrestleMania at the stadiums a few years ago. Do you think they sell a million tickets though? No, because I don't think they run enough shows. Yeah. And 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 I I was about to say for the people who are gonna 
oh my god aew when they sold out all in or all out or all over or whatever take all of the non wwe live events of 2019 and put them all together in the united states of america do you think they sold as many live event tickets as the wwe itself did being fair no not even close i don't think okay so. so then if somebody was to find out how many live event tickets the wwe sell in 2019 and double that and say okay that's how many we sold in the united states of america and tell me how close you get to 12 million when there were what a hundred million fewer people in this country in 1951 than there are now here's a question for you and this may be an unreasonable question and again, it's not even an equal equation because you're looking at multiple different cities running. But if you took all the non-WWE shows of 2019 and you took all the, the attendance figures of all those shows, would that equal one month of wrestling in 1951? The whole I, year of 2019. I, I can't see how it would. I can't see how it would. Yeah, me neither. Um... In 1951, besides the fact that Chicago was doing great business, as we've talked about from the programs and the magazines we've excerpted here on the program, there was live wrestling four nights a week just in the Chicago metropolitan area in 1951. And there was a promotional war. But yes, that's right. There was, yes, there was more than one promotion going. So, and, and when you think about the, the, um, the weekly towns everywhere in the South. And, and then you think about the Madison square garden had just started back up and was a success again. And you go to, you know, there, there were some people as I, as I mentioned and hold on, let me check this article one more time and see if he, he does mention it because, uh, for a while when television came in, Paul Bowser in Boston tried it and nearly killed his business. Because the people were staying home and they were watching it on television live. Um, yeah, you know, all those cards we talk about in Boston from the 60s with Pfeffer booking for Tony Santos, they had no TV. No. You could still promote in those days the old-fashioned way with word of mouth and window cards and posters and radio, etc., newspaper. But, uh, but... Uh, Basically, TV in some places took a while to take hold, and it took a couple of starts and stops uh, before it was it was used in a, a way that would increase business instead of kill it off. And uh, Boston's one of them, and Memphis, uh, you know, was a great wrestling city for years and years, but. In the early 50s, when they were doing business, they tried local television, and it didn't stick. And it, it wasn't until in the mid-50s, finally, when Les Wolf uh, ended up getting bought out or pushed out or whatever the case may be by Roy Welch, and he got a television that he knew how to make work for them, that uh, that's the, the highest-rated television wrestling program of all the modern territories didn't even get started until 1957. So, it, you know, it just depended because a lot of people, that's why, honestly, the first clash of champions in Greensboro, North Carolina, at the Greensboro Coliseum, is so well remembered today in the great match with Flair and Sting and the Midnight and the Fantastics and blah, 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 and the great TV ratings he got. It was a poor live event house in Greensboro for the time. There was only like 6,000 people there, which was half a house for Greensboro. Because they knew they could stay home and see it on TV for free on the couch. That was still a concern even in 1988. That's why that Crockett knew and they had figured that the house was going to be down. And uh, but they were doing it for the for the rating and for the relationship with TBS. So uh, television. If you use it the right way, and and I mean, in the early days when there was no such thing as television and suddenly there became television, you had to figure it out and some places took to it and some didn't. But even, you know, even in modern times, the wrong kind of television can do more damage than it does good. 
when Ring of Honor had got on HDNet as it was at the time. They thought, okay, television, that's going to, you know, we should immediately see some kind of increase in our business. Then actually it was the opposite. They didn't see any increase in ticket sales anywhere. They saw a decrease in DVD sales because people were getting those, you know, that's what they were doing was putting just top arena matches in, in, in on the television program with no context or no build to drawing to an internet pay-per-view or a big live event gate or whatever. And it's causing people to just say, well, maybe I can skip that DVD because look, but that was only for the really devoted because the main problem was nobody could see HD net at that point in time. It's access TV. Now we all know uh, who populates that part of the world these days, but, HDNet, when I was executive producer of the program, I had to pay $10 a month extra on my cable just to get the channel that my television program was on. So that that TV didn't do anything for them, and actually it you know set them back somewhat overall. It just depends. Anyway, your thoughts? First of all, let me just say, and I think a lot of the listeners agree, I've been loving the historical segments we've been doing lately on the show. And boy, Scott, keep putting, Scott Teal, if he's listening, keep putting out books if it's going to keep producing segments like this Yes, (laughs) here on the show. Should plug crowbarpress.com. I mean, this is such fascinating stuff. And, you know, in the past, when we've talked about some of Dave Meltzer's comments, you know, it's one of the things I always say that you can compare, you know, now versus then, but you really can't because there are so many intangibles and, So many things that are radically different in every respect in terms of promoting weekly, having weekly cities, local territories. It's just a different world now and then. And it's hard to even compare. It's two different businesses. It's hard to even compare the two. Boy, especially when you're looking at it in the ring, it's hard to compare the two these days. Um, 